birthday song, which is currently streaming on Netflix. She has done research for Ashim Aluwalia's Daddy, which streams on Amazon Prime. Vrishali is the author of the best-selling Can't Die for Sight. Uh, so, I think, I think uh, AB needs absolutely no introduction. Uh, Anirban Bhattacharya and Anurag Kashyap, we're all here for AB as, as we call him. Uh, Anurag uh, Kashyap, thank you for joining us. And uh, he's the winner of one national award for Film Fest, prolific filmmaker, and uh, has also been, uh, you know, the government of France has knighted him as the Knight of Order and Letters for his contribution to cinema. Uh, but what is interesting is we're here for AB's The Deadly Dozen uh, serial killers. And uh, what's interesting is that Anurag made his foray, in, and this is when I was doing my research, that he made his foray into Bollywood when he scripted Otto Naran. And Otto Naran is the first story of uh, The Deadly Dozen, uh, which, which he wrote, and that kind of impressed Ram Gopal Varma. And, you know, that was the start of so many other things. Uh, Paanch, has anybody seen Paanch? I mean, I, I love I love the film. A lot of us have seen Paanch over here. And uh, that was again based very loosely, or very loosely as, as is mentioned, uh, on the Zoshi Abhyankar uh, murder cases of 1976, the serial murders that, were, that happened in Pune, shaking the daylights out of the sleepy town of Pune. Um, and, and Raman Raghav, as we all know. So Anrak, welcome, and you're our chief guest. <laughs> thank you, thank you for coming. And AB, as we all uh, know, this is your debut novel. We're all here because of you. AB again needs no introduction. Super successful co-creator of Sabdhan India, and many, many impressive institutions: Channel V, Jamia, and Saint Xavier's Kolkata. And uh, well, we just got to know that the Deadly Dozen is also trending on Amazon. Uh, on Amazon uh, as a bestseller already and just yes yesterday was it when yesterday or day before uh, I read an article in uh, News 18 where uh, his his book is mentioned with doyens like Arundhati Roy and Amitabh Ghosh so congratulations and uh, yeah so let's get started I think we should see this trailer Check, check. Um, I really want to thank Anurag for, for taking the time out and, and coming. He's been running a very busy schedule and honest to God, I mean, thank you. You know, you, you don't realize uh, how overwhelmed I am right now. Uh, just to have you standing here and, and do this. For a debutant author, it's, you know, more than a dream come true. And I, and I really, really want to thank you for taking the time out and, and supporting the book. I have already have had a take on three of the stories. I know. <laughs> Chakki Chakkal and Otto Shankar and Ravan Raga. Thank you, thank you so much. Oh, but this is amazing. I already have my eye on one. On one of the stories? I can't say. <laughs> there's, there's somebody standing before me, so I'm waiting it out. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we just have a couple of questions for you and then you... Check, check. Okay. Yeah, so like you said, you know, you've already had a take on three and one is brewing in, in your mind. So what is it about uh, the serial killer, uh, the mind of a serial killer that, that draws you to it, that entices you to make films on them? It's so, always the inexplicable don't understand what makes them the way they are and and that's what is very interesting 
because it's, it's almost like you can't make sense of it. The most incredible thing is you just cannot make sense to it. The logic, the intelligence, the no kind of reasoning works there. It just is. But and that is what is scary about that. You, but, but when it's a piece of non-fiction and then when you have to fictionalize it, uh, what, are, what are the challenges that, that you face when we have to fictionalize something that, that has already happened and something so macabre? No, you don't need to fictionalize it. But the thing is, sometimes the circumstances force you to fictionalize it. Because, because I, I genuinely believe that uh, the, the truth is stranger than fiction. It is. Uh, because fiction still is created from a mind that is still trying to think when it's within its limited capacity. Yeah, but I, I've seen Panch and I've, I've seen it. Panch was inspired by the Jekyll case. Uh, yeah, yeah, by the. the, by the case, yeah. Uh, so, so, how did you fictionalize that? That is because uh, when I was writing Panch and I was working on the Jekyll case, I was told you can't make a film without music. My first film, so I was like, okay, fine, I'll make, make them a boy band. And so <laughs> the serial killers became musicians. But was that the only uh, fictional? No, part? It, because it's not that even the music uh, band thing was not fictional. It was also based on the band called Greek, which existed at that time, and it was based on their struggles with the system trying to do what they were doing in the rock scene, which was an underground band. So I took two different stories and married them together. When, when, I, was, when I was writing Raman Raghav, what you're saying is that it doesn't make sense it at all. Sense. Raman Raghav's story is... Yeah, Raman Raghav, the real where story you, is... Yeah, where do you even begin? It's is, is very... It's, a, it's one of its kind, the original Raman Raghav story. It's not like Otto Shankar or not like anything else, which still has some kind of a motivation. Yeah. You know, the Raman Raghav story is very strange and nobody wanted me to make that film, so I made Raman Raghav 2.0. But the thing is, we still borrowed some elements from yeah. the original Raman Raghav. With his sister relationship, everything we borrowed from the original story. Yeah, because yeah, it was just one guy who came, nobody knew about because My thing is like, if I can't make that, then I'll do something else. But I'll, I kind of invoked Raman Raghav to address a lot of other things that were surrounding us. Abhi, uh, and, uh, so when I, when I read Abhi's uh, uh, stories, uh, it, his writing is extremely visual, sucks you into that world. Uh, how difficult was it? Was it a natural prog progression from Southern India? Uh, what were the challenges that so, you faced when you were writing? Okay, so, I, I think uh, when you're talking about the visual element of the stories, it was a very deliberate attempt. Um, the stories are set across different eras, right, of India. I wanted to get that visual sense of the reader being present over there. Yeah, yeah even the language keeps changing. If you read Thak Behram, which is from the 1800s. Yeah, that's a, my, my thing is the only one that stands out for me is Thak Behram. I said, why, yeah. how, why, how do you put in Thak Behram in this, which is all of them are more now. Yeah. And Thak Behram is from... Yeah, from the 1800s, yeah. So, so I read up Captain Sleeman's account. Captain Sleeman was the one who actually captured, the, brought an end to the Thuggy movement. And they introduced new laws. Even and deceivers, and, like... Yeah. Shashi Kapoor on, yeah, on, yes, on the story. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, um, so this, I wanted it to be very visual and, and uh, you know, screenplay-like. So when you're reading it, you, you should be able to see, smell the blood, almost. You know, um, I just wanted to read out a passage. I think my book is somewhere here. Um, yep, thank you. I've marked it. I've done homework. <laughs> what is amazing, like if I have you around, people will not think I'm so dark. <laughs> not at all. Um, so this is um, just a little passage from uh, Thak Behram. Also, Thak Behram, I wanted to make it very filmy. Thak Behram is a story from the 1800s, so a lot of it is um, uh, report, you know, taken from rep uh, reports and all of that. But a lot of them is also imaginary scenes, because I don't know what Thak Behram actually did in a sense that uh, there are no day-to-day -day accounts of his life, right? So this is uh, Thak Behram, just a small passage I'll, I'll read out. The caravan moved silently through the night. The clanging of the bells around the necks of the bullocks, pulling the canopied carts, was the only sound that could be heard. Around 15 men and women were traveling to a nearby village to attend a wedding. Fatigue was clawing at their bodies. They had been on the road for the past eight hours. How much further do we, have, do we need to travel to reach the village, one of the men asked. Or thus course replied an old man, the senior most person in the group. The cry of a jackal sliced through the night. 
the animal was nearby. The men grew alert, lifting their torches to see if they could spot the wild animal. Suddenly, the leader of the caravan halted his cart and put up his hand, signaling the others to do the same. Men, arm yourselves, he yelled. Two of the seven men in the party pulled out daggers from their kamarbans. They were carrying these to protect themselves, having heard about a dangerous group of dacoits prowling in the area. But what they saw instead was one of the victims. In the middle of the road lay a man who was groaning in pain. They left me for dead. They robbed me of everything. Water. Please give me some water. The men helped him lean against the wheel of one of the carts. After drinking his fill, he narrated his story. His name was Sukram. And he had been traveling with his wife. They were headed to a nearby village. He was poor and hence traveling by foot. A gang of dacoits pounced on him, looting everything, including his wife. At this point, he broke down. The travelers, they were shocked. One of, the, one of them gathered his courage and asked, Was it him? Sukram looked up and whispered, as if he were too afraid to even say the name out loud. Yes, it was him. Thak Bairam. At the mention of the name, a shudder ran through the crowd. The women inside the caravan who had been eavesdropping began crying. How did you manage to live? He kills everyone, a young man asked. Sukram got up slowly and said, How can Behram kill his own self? He let out a scream of a jackal and as he said this, out of the dark forest some fierce looking men appeared. They were bearded and red eyed. With a blood curdling cry they lunged at the travelers who were no match for the dacoits. Within minutes a hush fell upon the caravans. So this, I tried to be as, you know, visual as possible and, and you know, so. What, what, what it left me as a reader when I was when I was going through uh, you know through the book was uh, I was shit scared yeah. I just scared the daylights out of me like you know it, it actually it was like you know uh, you pull you know you just took the bull by the horns and said yeah, this is a parallel universe and they are out there and this you need fact, to, was, was that conscious to, no, to course, shroud your reader with a ball of uh, fear if we call it a parallel universe it's a mistake it's our universe shit is in this world we sort of we imagine we are living in an Enid blight and once upon a hillock there lived some elves and dwarves and it's not. And they lived happily ever after. Yeah, they yeah. don't. It's a shitty world. It's a scary world. They are all around us. You know, and I wanted them, I wanted the readers to realize that and that's what Southern India has done, you know, producing it for the last uh, seven years now. I realized that people seem to say, ah, you know, the bad always happens to other, other people. people. It can never happen to me. You know, and that is a completely a, a misnomer because it can happen to you. And I really wanted to to make the readers scared. Yeah, I mean, you, I, you I, keep, I keep breaking the fourth wall. If you read the story, you'll you'll realize I keep directly talking to the, you know, to the reader, saying, you know, uh, guard your children. They are not safe. There's a there's a story of Darbara Singh. Uh, he's a, he was a migrant killer, right? So he just killed migrant children. He just used to, you know, uh, take kids, rape them, kill them, you know, and that's a, and as a parent, I was really scared, you know, and so I've, I, I write it over there in the book saying, please, if you're sleeping with your children tonight, hug them tight, because they are safe and sound beside you, you know. We could go out and play. No, I'm saying if you go by the data, the number of children that disappear is yeah. so much more, and nobody knows where they're gone. Where they're gone. You know, our time we used to go out and play in the gully, and no one bothered. You know, we could just play. And now you can't even let your child out in the, you know, in the in the gully or in the compound. You don't know if they're going to come back or not. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's but true. Ironically, ironically, a lot of cases also happen in the 70s, and like you, you know, when we. No, you know, there, the there, were, there were a lot of 80s. 90s, and even 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 the last 10 years. Uh, there have been cases, the beer man and the stone man have happened yeah, recently. You know what they say, no? they say only like 10% of serial killers in the world have been found oh. and discovered. So there could be a serial killer residing in, just needs the little stars. Right. Okay. You need to uh, go or you okay? You need to go, right? Okay, so um, before you leave, I just want to present you with, uh, I grew up in Kalimpong. Yes, this, this too. I grew up in Kalimpong, so it's a tradition there that we present Tibetan khadas. So, Iram will present you the uh, Tibetan Khadas.
super, super. So, um, oh yes, oh, we've got something else for you. Oh, oh this is for you, for being kind enough. Oh. Yeah. And this is all uh, candy stuff. Gift hamper. Yeah. Got a gift, gift hamper. Mix it free. So this is, 